Hello and welcome to Tokenomics. I'm Anisha Gupta. The world of crypto and finance has been abuzz with the idea of tokenizing real world assets on the blockchain, which simply means converting the ownership of real world assets like stocks, bonds, real estate and commodities into a digital token. This has even grabbed the attention of the US Federal Reserve, which recently released a working paper that explores the advantages and use cases of asset tokenization. Back home, the International Finance Services Center Authority has formed a committee to frame regulations for the tokenization of real and physical assets. To understand the impact of tokenization on world economy, we are now joined by Dilip Chinoy, who is chairman of Bharat Web3 Association. Mr. Chinoy, hi, thank you so much for joining us. And clearly the world is a buzz buzzing for some time now. We have seen various banks talk about it as well. But even if you put aside many of these banks and institutions, there is this retail buzz as well. Even the crypto native place is talking more about tokenization of real world assets. Yeah, so if you look at uh, tokenization of real world assets, there are multiple things happening at different, different levels and across different industries. If I were to take uh, three uh, examples, right, and I'm going to take Indian examples. So there's a company in India that is actually tokenizing, uh, tokenizing ships, right? So a ship is a large, large investment. And uh, how do you actually break it up into smaller investments and then lease the ship to a shipping company so that the shipping company actually just pays the lease rental and the actual owners of it are fragmented across different geographies in the country and outside. And this is a real life example. And they earn a return on the, uh, on the asset as it, the usage goes up. Now, this is very interesting model for large capital intensive uh, tokenization uh, projects. The second example I like to take is from the real estate uh, sector. So there's a company in Bangalore has uh, you know, actually fractionalized and tokenized a, a real estate uh, uh, combination of multiple flats where uh, people, uh, many people are actually owning a part of one flat and they earn a revenue out of the rental uh, that the uh, flat uh, gets and in the long term, they hope to uh, be able to you know, use the appreciation in the real asset value to gain uh, you know, returns. And the third is a very simple thing is happening in this thing and you know, uh, uh, a major artwork, uh, too expensive for me uh, to buy. Uh, you do tokenization and then allow people to own fractional parts of that artwork going ahead. And I'm talking of non-financial uh, kind of uh, uh, tokenization here. Oh, well, absolutely. And there's just so much happening within the finance world as well. But, you know, the U.S. Fed paper also is exploring asset tokenization. According to you, as per your knowledge, how many countries or regulators, even banks, are looking at this when it comes to regulatory part? So if you look at uh, the, the financial sector uh, tokenization of uh, different assets that you hold, I mean, the you know the, the uh, uh, there are about eight countries, if I look at it, who have active uh, programs in this uh, uh, in this space. And even in India, if you look at this coalition of banks that have got together to form that independent company to look at uh, uh, to look at the use of blockchain uh, within uh, the sector, even they are exploring the idea of how do you tokenize securities. Because once you do that, it's very simple, uh, you know, to track and to, you know, uh, to be able to fractionalize assets and get many more participants in the uh, whole ecosystem going uh, going ahead. Um, so eight countries uh, are definitely uh, looking at that. Two have done uh, pilots, right? And uh, many more uh, pilots are on the way. Japan is far ahead. Uh, of uh, I think they've actually even allowed uh, people to issue startups to issue tokens to raise money. Mm. So as you said, financial markets and banks, even countries are looking at it. But when we look at normal daily, day-to-day -day life, common people, where have you seen tokenization touching them and also traditional businesses for that matter? 
So the real estate uh, tokenization is one example where it is actually touched, let's say, in Bangalore or in, 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 in uh, Kolkata, uh, in India, it has touched uh, the common uh, man. The other uh, aspect of where uh, it has uh, touched the uh, common man is, is, is slightly financial, but, you know, uh, if you go to, let's say, Flipverse and, or, or, and you look at it, uh, you actually can uh, tokenize, uh, you know, uh, the your your reward points and your other things that that you're looking at. It's a, it's still in a very pilot stage, but it, it you know any shopper uh, there could actually, depending on what they buy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they could uh, get uh, uh, tokens. In the gaming industry, some initial uh, uh, you know forays have happened. So if you're a gamer. And there are, you know, few hundred million gamers in uh, in India. For them, it'll be a very new experience actually being able to look at that. And the recent, uh, you know, the GST uh, amendment and putting tokens and and virtual digital assets as part of the overall thing uh, is going to give a fillip to that sector. Of course, art is very different than many you know, artists here. And if you were to take NFTs as tokens, and if you look at it, uh, maybe you know it, it's currently restricted to 450 creators on a particular uh, group called Fanstar, if I were to say, who are tokenizing their creations and ensuring that uh, you know, that people who view it or people who uh, actually enjoy that um, can, uh, you know, the whole payment the system is on the chain, and you know you get a reward. Uh, for the intellectual property that you have created. <laughs> all right. This is all very exciting and interesting. And I also want to get to numbers now. And the Boston Consulting Group has estimated that tokenizing real-world assets could become a 16 trillion industry by 2030. How would you look at that? Where do you think that the major push or absorption or adoption will come from? So, Manisha, you, you know, if you look at uh, the number and what they have talked about, right, uh, they have talked about how do you uh, look at uh, any real world asset okay so if i take if i take the real world uh, real estate right in india so if you were to even tokenize 10% of that you know uh, it 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 actually adds a huge uh, number to it and i don't i don't i think what the bcg has uh, done uh, you know is to look at what is the real current real estate uh, value? And they have looked at uh, what fraction could it be, uh, you know, fractionized uh, or, or uh, you know, tokenized, and uh, putting a kind of a thing of the adoption rate, right? So I I believe that uh, it's a pretty realistic number. You can apply the same principles to the Indian real estate sector. And I think the REITs that have been approved by SEBI, the two REITs, uh, you know, different REITs that are there, with they have the 200 crore, uh, you know, floor. This thing, those also will find an opportunity to be to be uh, tokenized uh, going forward. So uh, it's a great opportunity. Real estate is only one. You take any real world asset. I gave you the examples of ships. It can be extended to uh, cars. It can be extended to um, aeroplanes, it could be extended to any uh, real world uh, asset uh, there uh, going forward. So I don't think that the number which uh, they have uh, talked about is difficult to achieve, but the fraction will vary in different different countries there. And this is very interesting. This, uh, you know, uh, possibly uh, doesn't really face, if it's a non-financial kind of uh, segment, it doesn't face any regulatory hurdles. You only need to get the uh, the process in place because with real estate, the challenge is, you know, is the title genuine, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we are working with. Uh, BW is working with the Telangana government to create a whole uh, process around that. Mm. Well, of course, the various state governments in their own uh, jurisdiction are working with a lot of things when it comes to blockchain and tokenization. But, uh, you know, the overall government doesn't really seem very comfortable. What is the attitude that you've seen from the regulators onto this one? Uh, where, where do you see a gap that needs to be filled by the government? I think there are three different levels that India is operating on. And I think the first thing is a global level where we are looking at how can we get uh, a global consensus 
on different aspects of the regulation, including you know the under the FATF uh, reporting entities disclosure of uh, you know virtual digital assets uh, held, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, to look at preventing arbitrage, you know, and people relocating in one different country versus another versus India. So uh, depending on regulatory arbitrage or tax arbitrage, so that's at the global level, and I think. We will see some movement happening uh, possibly in the second week of October when the uh, central bank governors and other meet in Marrakesh. The second uh, level is at the national level where we have uh, different regulations put in place, whether it is the one uh, relating to uh, the, again, the uh, uh, anti-money laundering or, you know, terrorism, which is the, which is, you know, everyone has become a reporting entity under the FIU. The second uh, kind of uh, regulation is, uh, you know, disclosure and taxation levels of uh, VDAs uh, under, uh, you know, under the Income Tax Act, and that's a gray area. So a real estate, so a real estate uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, token. Um, you know whether it falls under a VDA or whether it falls outside that that has to be clarified and more or less it will be outside uh, that. And then third at the state level, where you know state governments, uh, when I gave the example of West Bengal, Telangana, you know the, in Karnataka, uh, something also happening in Maharashtra, where people have tokenized uh, assets and going ahead, and then you know the regulatory uh, regul there's no actual regulatory challenge, but it making carving out. A kind of space it does not fall into the crypto or the cryptocurrency uh, part of it so at three different levels we see regulation happening but we believe that the taxation aspect on this has to be uh, cleared um, and um, i think you know uh, the distinction made between investing in a you know in a non real real a real asset backed token versus a real asset back token has to be made, NFTs have to be segregated here. And globally, I think even BW is working with the Singapore Association, the MICA or the, the EU Association and you know the North American Association to get a global taxonomy uh, across tokens so it becomes very easy for regulation and we hope to take it to the government uh, soon. Oh, well, absolutely. While well, all of this looks doable and very exciting, but as you said, there are various levels that the work is being done on. It's corporates, it's banks, it's financials, it's uh, state uh, governments, governments, and on the global level as well. But uh, yes, uh, there is work being done and there is a lot of positivity coming in here. Mr. Shinoy, thank you as always for joining us at CNBC TV 18. On that note, it's time for a short break, but don't go anywhere because this discussion continues with Ashish Anand of Roo Finance and Pranav Maheshwari of Edge and Node when we return. Welcome back. You're watching Tokenomics. I'm Anisha Gupta and we take the discussion ahead with Ashish Anand, founder and CEO at Brew Finance and World. Ashish, hi. We've, we've understood all about tokenomics and how it works from Dilip, but you know, you are working with a very important stakeholder that is commodities and farmers. Do tell us on how tokenization has helped this sector. How much worth of commodities have been tokenized on your platform till time? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, first of all, Manisha, for inviting me to this program. So talking about uh, what we have been doing, so essentially we have been helping the farmer segment through tokenization. And while certainly there have been a lot of huge cases which have been discussed, this is one huge case which brings financial inclusion using tokenization directly to the, po uh, directly to the homes and uh, directly to the economics of the agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. So, we tokenize the agri commodities which are stored in warehouses, typically government warehouses. And we are running two platforms. Uh, in the TradFi side, we are running World. We, on the DeFi side, we are running World Group Finance. And actually, globally, this is the first example of one single protocol working on the both traditional finance and decentralized finance using uh, tokenized real uh, world assets. Uh, we are today. Um, Globally, the largest commodity tokenization players, and certainly in India, we are the largest tokenization players. Uh, we have tokenized more than 6,000 crore, uh, almost, uh, uh, almost uh, $650 million worth of commodities which have been stored in warehouses. We have been doing this, I mean, much before RWA became so much 
popular in the crypto world. We started doing that way back in 2020. And during the COVID period, we have given loan of more, more than 100 crore rupees to the farmers on our platform against tokenized uh, real estate, tokenized commodities, tokenized real world assets. And let me tell you that while globally the banks are still thinking doing POC pilots and spreads on tokenization in India, banks on our platform are actually lending against tokenized real world assets. And they are lending to farmers using these tokens as a collateral. So that's what we have been doing. And uh, we, we are actually now launching supply chain finance. Uh, we just partnered with uh, MasterCard and that will be again uh, one of the first examples across the globe to bring credit card against tokenized real world assets. So those are certain plans which we are working on and certainly DeFi is another angle which we have added. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, Ashish, when it comes to accessibility, affordability and reaching to the last mile, you pretty much have done that. Tell us on what the challenges are in this space right now. Oh, well, um, so the challenges, of course, have been quite a few. First challenge was to onboard the custodians, means custodian warehouses where the agri-commodities could be deposited. The second challenge was, of course, to get the banks to come on board, who, because this was a new thing, lending against tokenized uh, commodities. So that also took a lot of time. But thankfully, now from the banking sector, we have uh, got the credit line of 1,200 crore rupee. So that, that problem has been solved to a large extent. Another problem which we see is, and which we saw in a very novel way, that how do you explain something like this to a segment like pharma, uh, who might not be even digitally savvy or may not be having even a mobile phone. So that is one major challenge which has remained, but for that we have adopted certain measures. We have gone to the doorsteps of the farmers. We have taken the technology to them without telling them that, hey, this is something called an NFT backing this. So that is something we are solving. The, uh, the physical and the digital aspect of this is something which will remain uh, to be solved over a period of time. Oh, well, absolutely. Great numbers, Ashish. I mean, as you said, you're globally the biggest when it comes to commodity tokenization and loans to farmers as well. Many kudos to you. Congratulations. And we'll, of course, keep coming back to you for more on that. But let's also bring in Pranav Maheshwari. He's solutions architect at Edge and Node. Pranav, hi. Just so much being done in uh, when it comes to tokenization. How would you look at, uh, you know, a lot of tokenization is underplayed right now. There are some credibility issues as well going into some of these companies. Uh, what is the way to look at this? What kind of transparency, credibility would one be watching out for? Definitely. So first of all, like tokenization is something that more than India, the US Fed, as you were talking, is looking into. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, for them, it's a like, you know, it's, it's a very big advantage. Because tokenization and real world asset are two things. One is tokenization of assets so that it is accessible. If you, even if you have ten dollars, you can take a small part of a hundred billion dollar infrastructure piece or something. And the second thing is crypto, which is kind of something which makes things global, right? And uh, what stable coins in the United States have done is that it, it has taken money from different parts of uh, different countries, including Turkey and Argentina, where inflation is a very big problem, and converted those things to USDC. So people actually uh, get their salary, convert them into USDC, USDT, so that they can you know, play around inflation. And at the end, the US uh, uh, Treasury and the US bonds are the ones which are benefited because Circle and Tether invest in the US economy so that they can maintain their one is to one peg. Now, coming to the tokenization of this, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, U.S. Treasury bill is the third step towards United States dollarization of cryptocurrency and in general, uh, uh, you know, real world assets. What happens is that United States Treasury bills or the T-bonds are the ones which, like, you know, many organizations like MakerDAO and Centrifuge are actually uh, focusing into. And what they have done is that they have taken the U.S. Uh, T-bonds, like, you know, in, in uh, as collateral mm. and have issued tokens on top of that what it means is that a person living in turkey a person living in argentina which cannot as of now could have access the united state uh, states treasury bonds mm. can now go and access those kind of like you know uh, security options which makes uh, united states in a way very much like you know likelihood a place for keeping assets on the other hand mm. uh, for people and citizens like argentina and uh, turkey, turkey where inflation is a very big problem 
to also get exposed to the US Treasury bill, plus get a 5% interest on their USDC and USDT, which they have kept, which around right now is at a market cap of about $100 billion. So this tokenization industry in a lot of financial manners, not just non-financial with Dil Dilip Ji figured out, is mm -hmm. in a bigger, bigger state because now you have such big capital and such big capitalistic country and everything is being tokenized for everybody other than the United States citizens. Oh, well, absolutely. So, you know, Pranav, when it comes to uh, uh, common people, normal people, before we start getting into this, what do you think are the technological, operational, logistical challenges to solve? Definitely. So, the uh, real world asset, first of all, is the newest class in the Web3 economics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this is the first time we are taking off-chain stuff, which is like, you know, uh, the infrastructure which does not happen on the blockchain. Infrastructure is in the real world. Or something like United States Treasury bills, which are not at all on-chain. They are rather legal co uh, commodity options in a way, right? Similarly, other paintings and ship Phoenix doing ships. All these, these are real-world assets. How do you keep these real-world assets on-chain is a very big problem. And there are few organizations like Centrifuge trying to solve for that. But there is there are always middlemen in between. When we call Web3 and blockchain as permissionless, and Ethereum and other such blockchains permissionless, when anybody can list tokens and start trading on it without much of a regulatory uh, like you know uh, overburden, in real world asset that's not the case because you are dealing with real world uh, like you know things which come under jurisdiction of that particular country. So how do you put those off chain entities and assets? On-chain is a very big uh, question to tackle for real-world uh, asset classes and real-world asset uh, program managers and uh, projects. Then that's something that some projects are trying to solve right now with the uh, blockchain oracles, with Chainlink and Redstone. And few are uh, putting and uh, complying some of their legal staff to do something like a Web 2.5 kind of a condition in which real-world assets will have legal compliance docs that will be converted into NFTs and those NFTs will be put into liquidity pools to tokenize everything. So this is like, you know, a kind of a, uh, what I can say is a kind of a compromise on the Web3 standards of real world assets to make tokenization. But again, you know, this is a very up and coming field and we have just seen a good amount of uh, uh, interest by different mainstream protocol protocols in Web3 like Synthetics and MakerDAO coming into the picture. So we we'll still have to figure out and find out good infrastructure so that we can onboard the off-chain entities to on-chain. But again, this is coming and will uh, go through and as well as get some regulation going around. So should should be solvable, but yeah, as of now is a problem. <laughs> All right. Pranav, thank you so much for joining us. Well, so much to do and so much to learn in the space and so much to watch out for as well. With that, we've come to end of this episode of Tokenomics. Thank you so much for watching.